morning. Yeah. I want to be faithful uh, to just uh, let you know the Spirit of God is speaking right now, wherever you're at. Uh, last night we were in service, and uh, Pastor Dave Collins had a word that I think is applicable to us this morning, and I just want to start with it. It was in, in my notes. I'm going to try to remember it as well as possible, but he said as we were worshiping, and it was here but across all campuses, he said he saw what looked like canteens in everybody's hands or in many people's hands, and they came with their water, but when they opened it, it was rancid because they'd been filling up at the wrong streams. But God is looking for a people who will dump out the water from the wrong stream and let him fill it from the right stream. And so I just want to be faithful to deliver that word. Yes, go ahead and clap. Now let me tell you about the application of that word. This isn't for everybody, this is for you. I want you to ask yourself the question, where have I been going to to get water? What what have I been allowing in my heart that isn't what God wants in my heart? What am I drinking of that I am trading down from what God has for me? He doesn't interrupt times of worship for no reason. He interrupts them because he wants to speak a message, but I didn't want to keep it to myself. I wanted to give it to you. And so, Father, we just ask that you would do in us and that you would remind us in this moment that you're still speaking, that you're still moving, that we can hear you But more than that, we can walk into the things that you promised. Amen. Amen. I was, I remember stepping off of an airplane in Kenya, East Africa. I'd been there before. I'd I'd lived there for about four months, but I was about to do something I never imagined I was going to be able to do. I took about 35 to 40 youth right from here about 22 years ago to Kenya, East Africa for a mission trip that lasted a month. I remember walking off the plane and smelling that sweet, wonderful, dry Nairobi air and going, God, I wonder what you have ahead for me. I wonder what you have ahead for these young teenagers that you are longing to make an impression on. Little did I realize what he had in mind. We split into two teams. We, I took a team to the coast in a place called Malindi and Mombasa. We did crusades in a place called Chumgamwe, which most of you have probably never heard of, but it's like a suburb, if you could call it that, of uh, Mombasa. And while we were there, we held crusades in a park. And we had, it was the time that human videos reigned, if you know what I mean. It's where we'd, do it, we'd act out a song and draw people and give a message of who Jesus was. And we saw crowds build over the weeks that were there. We're three weeks doing crusade after crusade after crusade. Kids were giving their testimony. People's lives were being changed. People being filled with the Holy Spirit. People were being healed, prophetic words. It was like everything you wanted and you never thought you could ever experience. And my heart was full. And then something happened that literally changed the whole trip. I had a youth leader, his name was Jacob Goodlin. I don't mean him any harm, he's a great guy, he's a missionary in Cambodia right now, but at this moment, he was about to do something reckless, and I didn't want him to do something. God was doing great things, it was going really well. And he came to me and he goes, Pastor Mike, we got like three days left. He goes, Pastor Mike, there's like three days left, but today while I was out in the the city, I found a guy who He's walking with crutches because he's had polio from a young age. And I think God wants to heal him. And I was like, that is great, Jacob. So I invited him tonight and I told him you're going to pray for him so he could be healed. Now, I was in my heart, I was like, what have you done? But out of my mouth, I was like, thanks, Jacob. Like, as timid as all possible. And then he went on to say, and I told everybody, all the kids know, it's going to be awesome. And I am terrified because there was a man with a leg that had been misshapen for most of his life coming to our service that night, expecting God to heal him. I didn't know what I was doing. I was comfortable with headaches. I was great with lower back pain. I was even fine if you had a sprained ankle. But polio? 
Like that's beyond like what I ever dreamed, imagined, and I was terrified. So I went into this time frame where I was praying in the morning and the kids were fasting. I mean, we were 100% sold out. God's gonna heal this guy of polio. It's gonna be awesome. And I was both there and I was terrified. And I was doing, I don't know, if put yourself in this position. I was like, okay, God, you need to do this. Like, you're gonna destroy all the faith of these kids if you don't do this. Like, I'm holding God hostage to this thing. I'm like, if you don't show up, like, I don't know what's gonna happen. We're gonna have a bunch of atheists after this because what you might not do. So like, I'm doing that going. And then I had moments where I was praying. I'm like, oh God, this would be so cool because you could start a healing ministry and it would be amazing. We could see you move in power across the world. That would be fantastic. I'd love to do that. And then the moments were like, God, I'm terrified. Like, I don't even know how to do this. I didn't, I didn't see this in the scriptures where you had a guy with polio. They never said polio is not in the Bible. I read it. It's not there, and I'd get amped up, and I'd get scared inside, and that night came, and I, like Jacob, is like a hawk just watching the audience. There was like a 1,000 people there, and he's watching just to see if the guy with polio came, and he didn't come, and I was both relieved, like really relieved, and also a little bit disappointed, and so we were talking afterwards, and the kid's like, that's okay. We still have two more nights, and we're praying and we're fasting and we're asking God to move. And the next night he doesn't come, but it's the last night. We know we have to leave. And he shows up at the beginning of service, like before service started, which was unusual in Kenya. And he's standing there and throughout the message, he gives his heart to Jesus. He begins to like make a connection with the pastor and then the whole night comes to a close, and it's that moment, you know, that moment where you're like, okay, here we go, hope this works. And he comes up surrounded by 28 kids that are so excited to see God heal a guy with polio. And I'm like, okay, I don't know. I, I remember he said, pick up your mat and walk. So I'm like, well, maybe he needs to just throw down his crutches and walk. Like, that seems like what Jesus would do because I had the bracelet at the time, what would Jesus do? And that was like, <laughs> makes sense to me. And so I remember him there, we're praying, and it's that terrifying moment where I'm like, am I really, is this real? Am I dreaming? And is this a nightmare or is this a, like gonna be the best dream ever? And I look him in the eye and I said, okay, we're gonna pray for you, then I want you to throw it on your crutches and just walk. And he's like, we have a translator, but he's like, okay. And so we pray, and I tell him to throw down his crutches. He throws down his crutches, and he falls forward right into one of my youth leaders who caught him right before he hit the ground. But while he was falling, so was my faith. So were our faces. We were convinced that God was going to move until he didn't. And then we were discouraged. I was confused, discouraged mad, apologetic, disappointed, crushed, embarrassed. I felt all the feelings because I had this idea of Jesus that caused me to think, if I just fill in the blank, if I just want it bad enough, then God will heal this man or heal my grandma or touch this person. If I was passionate enough, if I was committed enough, if I got kids to pray, then, oh, he might not hear my prayers, but he could hear their prayers. If I was earnest enough, if I got people to trust him for their healing, he would heal them. But if I put him on display, then surely God would. I landed on this. If I just had enough faith, then he would heal the people I wanted him to heal. I had a crisis. My crisis of faith was faith in this situation didn't equal passion. Faith in this situation didn't equal desire. It didn't equal desperation. It didn't even equal earnestness, like that deep down, I'm going to go forward with this because I know you're going to do, and I believe 100% completely that you will. So I had to figure out, what does faith really equal? And honestly, what, hap what happened next 
really like roasted by marshmallow. Because we, I know, that's, a, that's the only thing I have in my brain, marshmallow, and then it was roasted. That's intentional. I know, you probably don't say that, but you should. It's good. Um, we left Kenya, and we flew back through London, England. Um, we are, there was a pastor on staff at that time. His name was Ray Mayhew. And Ray had connected us with a young man that was starting a church in the Soho district of London, the red light district of London. And we were going to spend an extra day in London and all minister as the two teams came back together and, and were one team. And I left Kenya completely deflated, along with a bunch of kids that were like, I don't know if God does what he says he's going to do. I'm confused. And so we woke up the next morning and we met Pastor Brian, not this Pastor Brian, but a different Pastor Brian with an English accent. So everything he said sounded brilliant. And he told us his plan, which sounded brilliant and super simple. So in, in Kenya, we had this group of kids and they would sing songs and they would do these skits and they would draw attention. And in Kenya, we were novel, we were great, it was exciting. In England, we were just noisy. And Pastor Brian was like, that's perfect. I want noisy kids to do noisy things so that they can draw attention to what God wants to do. And so your kids are gonna be on these stands over here, they're gonna be doing their songs, their human videos. I want them going out into the crowd and inviting people over. You and I, we're gonna sit at this table I'm going to be on one side, you're going to be on the other side. In the background, there's going to be this sign that says free healing in English and underneath it in Mandarin. And then Jesus heals in English and in Mandarin. And we're just going to pray for people and they're going to get healed. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, this is not what I signed up for. And I'm like, fine, okay, I got to be the pastor that participates and does the things so the kids don't see open rebellion out of their pastor. It would be bad. It's already been bad. And so we were sitting at the table and I thought, okay, God, I can do this. I'm still mad, by the way, not happy with God. He and I are on speaking terms because he's the Lord of my life, but I am confused, disappointed, and still hurt because he didn't show up. And I'm like, God, I don't know what to do. Like, I'm not good at this healing thing. Like, you are good at this healing thing, but you don't really want to use me. So I'm going to suggest you use Brian's prayers because they're great. Did you hear him? He sounds brilliant. So we did, that's what we did. People would come forward and we'd pray for them and I'd let Brian pray. I'd put my hand on Brian's shoulder and be like, man, what he says is so good, God do it. You know, people were getting healed, it was cool. We did this for four hours, four agonizing hours of me being in a place where I didn't wanna be. But two hours in, there was this lady who was led up to us because she couldn't see. And she sat down right across from me and I looked right at Brian and said, go ahead, because this is clearly yours, not mine. And she said from birth, she's had this problem where she has so many floaters in her eyes that she can barely make out shapes and she can't see people. So she doesn't know what we look like. She can see shadows, kind of. And we're like, okay, well, we're gonna pray for that. So Brian prays, and while he's praying, he prays this great prayer. He sounds English, he sounds brilliant. God loves English people. That's why they're in a lot of our videos. And he gets done praying, and she opens up her eyes and says, thanks, but it, nothing happened. But in that little moment when she opened up her eyes, I was reminded of this story in the book of Mark, chapter eight, where Jesus prayed for a man twice. And he prayed for him to be healed. He was blind. And he opened his eyes and Jesus said, what do you see? And he said, I see men walking like trees. And Jesus going, not that he was an optometrist, but he's like, that doesn't sound right. So he's like, could we pray? And he prays for him a second time. And I, that passage just popped into my head, which was unusual because I don't think about that passage ever. And I get this sense in my gut of God going, do you trust me? Like, would you pray for her a second time? And I'm like, I don't want to. Like, I'm still frustrated from a week ago in Kenya, and I'm sitting there looking at this lady thinking, but what if? And is it my choice? Like, do I get to choose this thing, or does he choose this thing? And so I said, of course I'll pray for her. And so she's about to get up with her friend and leave, and I said, hold, hold on a second. There's this, and I told her about the passage in the Bible. Would you mind if I prayed for you a second time? So I reach across the table as a young 20-something, 29, here's the picture, that's me, um, a little skinnier version, I was younger. 
Um, I reach across the table. That's actually the lady. I put my hands on her head, and I just pray without any passion. God, I know you can heal. I know it. I know that to be true. And I'm asking that you would heal her eyes so she can fully see. Amen. That was it. I got done praying. I put my hands down, and she opened her eyes, and she did that. You know that thing when you're like, she did that. And she looked at me, and I was not ready for this. But she's like, oh, I can see. And she reaches across the table, and she says, I can see your face. And she turns to Brian and says, tell me about this God who just healed me. It was amazing. Yeah. And I think God do it again. I want to see crutches like this left here because people walk out of here. I believe that he wants to do that, not just in the church, but out of the church and more often in the middle of the city rather than in the middle of our safety zone. Because he's not a God of security. He's a God of fire, power, and transformation. And I still believe it today. And I learned something about faith that day. I learned that faith is active trust in the waiting position. Okay, I want, like, trust looks like this. God, I trust you. I believe in you. You're good. I know you're going to do all the things I want you to do. But I'm passively sitting back here. But God's like, okay, if you believe me, then take a step forward. Faith is when you take a step forward where, there's no, where there appears, appears to be nothing to support your foot. And the moment that you transfer weight from your back foot to your front foot and you're out there floating, that's active trust. There's passive trust, active trust. But that waning moment where, God, if you don't show up, I'm going to look like an idiot. People are going to think I'm crazy. I'm going to be misunderstood. I'm going to look stupid. Some people might even hate me and say bad things about me. But if you remember, Jesus was the one that said, well, if they hated me, I mean, they're going to hate you. Like, he just went around healing people and telling them, I died for you because I love you. And they're like, well, you hate that. So, of course, they're going to hate you, too. Faith is our willingness to look stupid at our own expense while God places the right people into the situation for maximum exposure of who he is, okay? Faith is our willingness to let go of ourselves so that he can show himself as God, as he directs, not as we direct. So if it comes down to it, faith is more about duration than it is about perspiration. I want to say that again. Sometimes we look in the Bible, and if you really read the Bible and you see where Jesus talks about, oh, ye of little faith, it's because they stopped trusting early. Peter looked away from Jesus, started to sink. If you would have just held on a little bit longer, I would have showed up. I, want, I challenge you, go back and look where Jesus talks about faith in the Bible, and you'll find out it's about duration more than perspiration. Oh, God, you got to do this because he's the God who is looking for someone who really trusts him, even if they look stupid in the middle of it. Look what he did to the prophets. Like, he did that all the time. I want you to get swallowed by a fish and go to a place you hate. Like, that's a horrible idea. I, you get to marry a prostitute. That's also a horrible idea. I mean, like, nobody wanted to be a prophet. People are like, don't, don't pick me. Like, that sounds like the worst idea ever. So you might be wondering, who are you? because I never introduced myself. My name is Mike Hintz. I'm one of the pastors on staff here, and it is Pentecost Sunday. And it was on this day that we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on a group, 120 people in the upper room in Jerusalem. And here's the funny thing. You may not know this. It says this in Acts chapter 2, 4. They were all sitting down. Did you know that? They weren't hooping and hollering and jumping up and down. They were just sitting, waiting, because Jesus said, wait. So they did. They trusted him over a period of time, and he showed up. But the question you might have is, why did he want them to wait? That's a really good question, and we're going to come back to it in a moment. But first, I want to ask this question. Who is the first person in the New Testament to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Does anybody know? It was Jesus. In Matthew chapter 3, he was at his baptism, and as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water, and at that moment, the heavens opened. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son in whom I love. And 
in whom I'm well pleased. Right before that, in uh, chapter 3, verse 11, John had said this, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie or carry. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And then Jesus walks onto the scene. This, by the way, is what this whole series has been leading up to. This moment, this morning. We are his people, as Les said at the beginning, of his presence. We are his temple. You've heard that. You are the temple. Did you know the you is plural? You, not you individually. You make up his temple. We are presence bearers of God everywhere we go. Jake sat up here in West Dodge and was lifting weights on a Sunday morning, teaching us about how Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, is our helper, that he helps us, he comes alongside of us, in us, for us. We learn from Les how to hear his voice. We learn from Micah that we can love more outrageously than we knew we could. And then we learned last week how to use the sword of the Spirit to, tr- to tear down the lies, deception, and misinformation of the enemy in our lives. And there's this saying I want you to know, that the Holy Spirit comes in you for you. But baptism of the Holy Spirit is where he comes upon you for others. And we're going to pick up the story in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, Jesus gave this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait here for the gift of my Father, as promised, which you've heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, you might wonder, what was the big deal about waiting in Jerusalem? First of all, none of these guys were from Jerusalem. They're all from like Galilee. They're up north. They had to come a long way to get there. They were there for the Passover. They were there for Jesus' crucifixion. And if we put like two and two together, Jesus was crucified because of his great unpopularity with some people with some power. And those people with some power were still around. They didn't also get crucified. They were the ones that were crucifying. And so it was breaking out that they did not like these Jewish followers of Jesus, and they felt uncomfortable. So the minute Jesus left after being with them for 40 days, he was like, peace out. They were like, sweet, we're going home. And he's like, hold on, wait in Jerusalem until the gift my father's promise is here for you. But but we don't want to wait. I mean, I can see it. They're like, We go to the grocery store, people are throwing things at us. Like, I'm always hiding from the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they're still out to get us. And it actually gets worse as time goes on. Finally, they all leave Jerusalem because the persecution was so bad. But in this moment, it was super uncomfortable. And I think it's important because often God will usually have us wait in a place that is uncomfortable for us before he moves. Because our uncomfortability is his opportunity. Do you understand that? Our uncomfortability is his opportunity to show up in the moment. Jesus, we just read that when he was filled with the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 3. The next verse, which is Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, says simply this, that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. Okay, so, like, he isn't afraid with 40 days of fasting and some uncomfortability. God will often put us in a place that is uncomfortable for us. But here's the why. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and into the utter ends of the earth, and Samaria and the utter ends of the earth. See, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, it's not for you. It's for others. And and you might be here this morning thinking, that's great, Pastor Mike, because you have a pastor in front of your name. Peter had fishermen in front of his name. Matthew had tax collector in front of his name. Judah, like not Judah, but a different, I'm sorry, it was, was it Judah? Who was the zealot? Somebody help me out. Simon, thank you. Simon the zealot had radical zealot like, freedom fighter before his name. These guys were ordinary people. They didn't get pastored and then get filled with the Holy Spirit. God breathed life on fishermen and on radical, like, freedom fighters and ugly tax collectors that were hated by everybody around them, like IRS agents, but worse, 
with some thugs. That's what Jesus thought. No, nah, that's a good idea. I want to put my spirit on them because I want them to go where? Just to churches? No, to the whole world. I want him to go to the whole world. That's his idea. That's his plan. But he will lead you to a place that is optimal for his plans, not your plans. This is probably the most important point. The Spirit will lead you, but it will not be where you want to go. Jesus often talked about this. If you want to follow me, you're going to need to take up your cross. You're going to have to die daily. It's going to be not the funnest thing for your flesh, but it's going to be, be the best life for you. Now, it might be that you get to go to Kenya and you're like lucky enough to pray for a guy with polio and not see him healed and then pray, go to London and see a, another lady healed of blindness. And that might be something God allows you to do. But I think he's going to like create a story for you. And there's a couple in our congregation. You've seen them here. They've been to all our campuses. It's Kurt and Emily Wagner. God spoke to them like seven years ago. Yeah, you can take, they're having a party this week. Did you know they're leaving for Serbia and they have five kids? They have five kids. They're leaving two kids here because they're out of the house. But three of those, their younger girls are still in the house. But a few years ago, they felt like God was saying, I want you to go to Serbia and help the work that Kiki is doing in Serbia. So they decided to begin a journey. Yesterday, for half of the day, I was in their apartment because they literally sold everything to follow Jesus. And they're just ordinary people. Kurt works as a computer programmer, okay? That's better than a tax collector, but not as cool as a freedom fighter. He's somewhere in between. <laughs> and yet, God said, I have an assignment for you. And Kurt's like, that seems super uncomfortable and very stressful. And God's like, yeah, this is going to be great, right? And he's like, kind of. Like, it's also going to be painful. I got to literally sell. I don't know if you think about it. They literally carried everything in their house in little boxes. They have a small storage unit where they're putting keepsakes. Everything else is gone. Why? Because they're special? No, because he's special. And he has a purpose for their lives. God will often call us to do things we would have never dreamed of because his plans are always better than our plans. When the day of Pentecost came, they're all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All, I love this, isn't that a great word? All were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And then, in this radical state, they walked out the door of the upper room and down some steps. And walking down the steps, they encountered one huge group of people. That sounded a little bit like Donald Trump. Huge. It was huge, I tell you. Um, they, this huge group of people, and they were speaking in other languages, like that they didn't know. And some people are like, what's wrong with these people? And some people are like, well, they've been drinking too much wine and it's only nine in the morning. What a bunch of crazies. And some people were jeering at them. But others were like, wait a second. We came to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost from really far away. And that's our language they're speaking. And they were declaring praises to God in their home language. But that was happening not just in theirs, but in everybody's language, they were hearing praises about who God was. And Peter steps up onto the scene. Peter the fisherman. Peter the guy that's denied Jesus three times, like 48, 49 days earlier, stands up and says, these men aren't drunk as you would suppose. But this is what the prophet Joel said when he said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit and your young men will dream dreams and your old men will see visions and you will prophesy and your sons and your servants and your maidservants will prophesy because the spirit of God is moving and signs and wonders will fill the earth. And they're listening to Peter and they're going, he sounds like a backwoods Galilean, but what he's saying is striking us to the heart. And in one sermon, this tiny little church that was the product of Jesus' three and a half years on this planet, which was 120 people, what a horrible growth model that would be, blew up from 120 to 3,120 in one sermon. 3,000 people were added to their number in that day. And then... 
people began to do something crazy. They began to sell their possessions and put it at the feet of the disciples, and the disciples gave it to everyone who had need, and no one among them had need. But that wasn't it. It didn't stop there. Peter and John were walking in the temple courts and they saw a man who was begging because he was crippled from birth. And Peter said to him, I don't have any gold or silver, but what I have, I give to you. And he reached down, pulled him up and he was healed. And he had been like crippled for more than 40 years. Like it was done. He, there was no hope for him. So there was provision and there was healing in the moment. But do you remember earlier when I said faith is active trust in the waiting position? When they were walking out of the room, they looked stupid. People said, what a bunch of weird drunk people at nine in the morning. They sounded crazy. People hated them. They were misunderstood. But 3,000 people were saved. A guy was healed who had been crippled from birth. People sold their possessions and all the people around them had everything that they needed. There were signs, there were wonders, there were healings. I need to tell you something about the temple. In the Old Testament, God uh, would use the temple as a demonstration of healing and provision for the nations. Like, if you read the last chapter of Exodus, Exodus chapter 40, I think it's verse 38, the fire of God came upon the temple at night, and during the day, it was a pillar of cloud. And it rested there as a sign that in the tabernacle was God. And he was there to heal, do signs and wonders, and provide for his people. He would lead them where they needed to go. He was the one that caused manna to fall from heaven. He took care of his people. He was the provider and the healer. As they built the temple in Solomon's day, it was a place that was a symbol of provision and healing for the nations. Because God didn't want Jew Jerusalem and the Jews just to be his people, he wanted to, to be the priest for the whole world, that the whole world would know him, and that they, out of that temple, would see provision and healing from the world, or for the world. But then, somewhere around 584, the temple got destroyed. About 200 years later, they built a new one, a little bit smaller, and there was this Roman occupation, and the people that took care of the temple, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who made up the Sanhedrin, there was division, there was infighting, there was contempt, there was a power struggle. And the temple, being a place of provision and healing, ceased to provide healing and provision. It just brought division and contempt. And the symbol of who God was became a shadow of what he used to be. But then the day of Pentecost came. God showed up. And where did all these miraculous things do? Where was he providing for the people? Right there in front of the temple. Because he said this, you. Like, no longer do I rest in a building made by man's hands, but I am one who inhabits the hearts of men. Because you, all of you, are the temple. I long to display myself in all of you. Peter says it great in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. He says, as you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus, to bring healing and provision to the nations. That's his design for you. And that's his design for me. Now, it's Pentecost Sunday. If I have one desire, it's that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. I want that more than anything, but I can't want it for you. In fact, you may think I've come to talk you into being baptized with the Holy Spirit, but actually I think I want to talk you out of it. It doesn't actually agree with our American version of Christianity. It doesn't agree with the idea that we can have Jesus and have whatever else we want. I want you to know that. There was a man, his name was A.W. Tozer. Uh, he wrote a book called Pursuit of God. It was a great book. And then he wrote a second book, which was the, the follow-up, the sequel to it, called The Divine Conquest. And he writes about it in The Divine Conquest. And he asks this question. He says, are you sure you want, to be, you want to be filled with the Spirit who, though he is like Jesus in gentleness and love, will nevertheless demand to be Lord of your life? 
Are you willing to let your personality be taken over by another, even if that other be the Spirit of God himself? If the Spirit takes charge of your life, he will expect unquestioning obedience in everything. He will not tolerate in you the self-sins, even though you're permitted and excused by most Christians to commit them. By self-sins, I mean self-love, self-pity, self-seeking, self-confidence, self-righteousness, self-aggrandizement, self-defense. You will find the Spirit to be in sharp opposition to the easy ways of the world and the mixed multitude within the precincts of religion. He will be jealous over you for good. He will not allow you to boast or swagger or show off. He will take the direction of your life away from you. He will reserve the right to test you, to discipline you, to chasten you for your soul's sake. He may strip you of the many borderline pleasures that other Christians enjoy, but which you which are to you a source of refined evil. Through it all, he will enfold you in a love so vast, so mighty, so all-embracing, so wondrous that your very losses will seem like gains and your small planes will see like, seem like pleasure. Yet the flesh will whimper under his yoke and cry out against the burden that is too great to bear. And you will be permitted to enjoy the solemn privilege of suffering to fill up your flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now with those conditions set before you, do you still want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I don't want this to seem easy because it's not easy. I don't want it to seem simple because it's not simple. It demands everything. But Jesus has always been demanding everything. We live in a world where suffering just doesn't sound pleasant and we're okay not doing it. But suffering begins when we trust him over trusting ourselves, where we put him in the driver's seat of our life. And so I wanna ask you this morning, wherever you're at, at any campus, in your home, in this room, do you wanna be filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, you might've been filled with the Holy Spirit before, but you're like, you know what? I need a refreshing. You may be that person that's like, you know what? I am one of those that you talked about at the beginning. My canteen is filled with rancid water because I've been going to the wrong wells. And today, as a symbol of dumping it out, I wanna be filled with the Holy Spirit and have living water in me. If that's you, for whatever reason, and you're in this room or you're at any of our campuses or online, would you stand to your feet right now? if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to come forward. We're going to pray for you. I'd love to have the ministry come down front, but I want to pray, and then I'm going to turn it over to our worship team at each of the campuses and our campus pastors. But do not leave this room until the Lord touches you and fills you with his Holy Spirit. Father, right now, I give you this morning. I give you this message. I give you this time. I've been obedient to do what you wanted me to do. I've said what I feel like you wanted me to say. And it's up to you. I trust you. You're good. You're calling your people to you. And now I'm asking God that fresh fire would fall on your church, fall on your people, fall in this room, and we would be people consumed with a passion for a living God as we burn like stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life. Amen. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. You can come forward and respond even as we're singing the song. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love. When my heart becomes free and my shame is up. 
by your presence, Lord. Say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. We're not done in this room and what's happening right now. We're going to continue in worship. But I'm going to invite you to respond. I'm so excited for each one of you that said, man, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as Pastor Mike addressed, we have our ministry team down front. Why? Because later on in Acts, the book of Acts in chapter 8, says that the apostles laid their hands on those and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So we believe there's power in the laying on of hands to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that's a bold step. It's a bold step that you stood to said, man, I want to be filled. And I know it's a bold step to step out of your seat, out of your row, and come down. And through the power of laying on of hands by this team that's filled with the Holy Spirit, we believe you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're going to continue in worship. I want to invite you. We're in no hurry. We have time. I want to invite you to come down front and be prayed for. It's, we know it's going to impact you in a profound way. So let's worship with all of our hearts. And you respond by coming down front. Our usher team will lead you through and guide you. It's going to be awesome. Let's worship together. And you respond. Here we go.
just a response of prayer. Father, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that you, Holy Spirit, you poured out so long ago and that you continue to pour out today. And Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you're here, that you're here in our midst. Lord, I pray that you continue to pour yourself out on us, your people. Lord, I thank you for the word that you come in us, for us and on us, for others. And Lord, I pray for your people here and online. You pour your spirit out. It would affect every inter encounter in work, in play, wherever we're at, Lord. Holy Spirit, that you would pour yourself out, Lord. We thank you for your presence here, the power of your presence in this room and what you're doing in our midst. And again, we just respond with our lives. We worship you. We love you. Everybody said together, amen. Amen. Can we applaud the Lord for all that he's done today? I love it. Listen, I want to encourage you. Our ministry team isn't going anywhere. Our, our worship team isn't going anywhere. We're going to continue to pray for you in any way that you feel need. But again, there's a, there's a power in the laying on of hands be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's an opportunity for you that's going to continue through the close of this service. Otherwise, if you're new with us, we'd love to see you at our Connect Zone out by our main entrance. I hope they all have a great rest of your weekend and a great week ahead. We look forward to seeing you again back here next weekend. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.